Good morning. I want to read from Deuteronomy chapter 16. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the people. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be held in awe above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. So worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. We're here today to worship the Lord and to recognize the awesomeness of the God that we serve. It's good to have you with us. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father God, we're just so grateful again to be able to be here this morning. Uh, This is an often awesome moment to be able to be in your presence and in the presence of like-minded believers in the body of Christ. And this is powerful stuff, Father, because you said that where two or more are gathered through your son Jesus, that he is there in our midst, so we hold him to that promise. We're trusting in that presence. And we're looking forward to what it is that we will receive from him this morning. Father, we just pray to you for guidance and blessing. We offer our holiness to you. Our holiness is not of ourselves, but it's totally because of what you you have done for us. And we give you all the praise and glory for that. And we thank you and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're very pleased this morning to have some visitors from Germany. They came all the way. Well, our oldest our oldest daughter is is an artist and uh, uh, paints a lot of pictures, and we have a lot of them at home, and uh, we value them highly. Uh, Artwork is uh, very subjective in terms of what value you place on it, but there's some artwork that is by culture at least, is very, very expensive, has a very, very high value. Some of that is found in the, uh, uh, in the gallery called the Louvre, which is in Paris. And it, of course, has the Mona Lisa, which is probably very familiar and very famous to everyone. But I remember there was a, a contest in the newspaper some time back where um, they asked a question, the best answer to that question. And that question was, if a fire broke out in the Louvre and you could only save one painting, which would it be? And the reply that won the contest was, the one nearest the exit. (laughs) I can sympathize with that. You know, there are some things that are absolutely priceless. You can't put a price on them. What about our life? More so, what about the life of our spouse, or the life of our children, or the life of our grandchildren, or what about your health, Uh, what about your sanity, what about your memory? Just things that you just cannot put a price on. And sometimes those things that are most important and have the greatest worth and value to us are things that we perhaps don't recognize until they are gone. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up, and then in his joy he went and he sold all that he had, and he bought that field. And then Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who finding one of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. In other words, no matter how much we may own, no matter how glamorous we might think we are, no matter how high our IQ is on the scale, if you've missed out on the kingdom of heaven, then you've missed out on the one thing in life whose value exceeds all others, absolutely all others, and that's the kingdom of heaven. So what can we say then this morning about the kingdom of heaven? By the way, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, most scholars say, are kind of interchangeable. And it could be that Matthew chose to use the kingdom of heaven because he did not want to use the name of God because he felt it to be too holy to speak. I have a good, well, I have a good friend, you know her very well, Marianne Foley, who has a great respect 
for the power of the name of God. I noticed when I first came here and she was playing the piano and the organ and we had meetings and so on and she'd write notes or so on. She would never write the full name of God. She would write G underscore D. And I asked her about that and she said that's because she holds the name of God to be righteous and holy. But the name Kingdom of Heaven, the title Kingdom of God, probably is interchangeable. So what is this kingdom that Christ spent most of his ministry proclaiming? Well, the first thing I think that we can say about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is that it's a present reality. And I don't think many of us recognize that. You might say, oh, really? Well, out of the 27 references in Scripture of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, 18 of those imply that it has an immediacy. It's, it's, it's here now. In fact, Jesus said the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, lo, here it is or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Those were Jesus' words. You see, wherever God is, that's where heaven is. And heaven is not just a distant thing that we, we, we look forward to in the future, but rather it's a present reality that begins now. It's a present reality that begins right now. Heaven is not a distant dream. It is in the present. The kingdom of God is the kingdom rule of God in the hearts of believers. And I simply can't understand why some Christians just seem to be sour Christians. Have you ever met sour Christians? Rick is here this morning, and Rick uh, does a wonderful job with comedy, and there's a, that's coming up again this year, isn't it, that uh, special in January? What's it yeah. called, Fun, Funny in a Good Way? Right, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's all about laughter and joy from a Christian perspective and a, from a healing perspective. And you know, I often wonder about Christians who just don't seem to have that joy. I ask myself, have they not seen, have they not heard that the kingdom of God is available to them now? You know, when it comes to the kingdom of God, it's not something about simply being positive in your thinking. You know, there's a lot of self-help books out there that talk about positivity and being positive in your thinking. It goes far beyond that. I'm hesitant to tell you this story, but it's rather cute because my dad told it quite a bit. And I got it from him. And he said, there was once this woman who had twin boys. And if you looked at them, they looked exactly the same. They had the same dimple, they had the same twist of the hair, same hair color, same height, everything. But if you were to speak to them, you would find that they were different as night and day. One was a sour pessimist, and the other one was an incurable optimist. So the mother took them off to the psychologist, and she said, Doctor, she said, can you help me out here? She said, you know, maybe make one a little more and the other one a little less. Can you kind of balance them up a little bit? And he said to her, well, I'll tell you what, this is what you do. He said, their next birthday, you fill the room that belongs to the pessimist with toys, all the toys that you can give him. Just fill the room with toys. And she said, oh, okay, I'll try that. What about the optimist? She said, well, get him a box of manure. She said, manure? He said, yep, box of manure. So the day of the birthday, she peeks in the room with a little pessimist, and there he is sitting in the middle of these toys complaining and saying, these toys are junk kid down the street has better toys than these. So it obviously didn't work. So then she looked in the room of the optimist, and there he was frantically digging through all the manure, saying, you can't fool me where there's manure, there's got to be a pony. <laughs> you know, we, we, we have optimism, right? But the kingdom of God is not about optimism. Optimism is far, far from the depth of what the joy that comes to us through recognizing that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, we can experience it right now. We get a foretaste of what that kingdom is. Now this is an important distinction to make. The kingdom of God is not only present, 
but it's also future in the sense that we are called to not only live within that kingdom and to live that kingdom, but we are also called to build that kingdom. You know, the, uh, in Galatians, uh, Galatians 5.22, I believe it is, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit, are you familiar with those? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? I remember them well just because we had a song. We sang that almost every week at the school where I was at. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those fruits of the Spirit are available to all of us. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are different, right? Gifts are given for the building up of the church, and not everybody has the same gifts. But the fruits of the Spirit... The more we become living within the kingdom of God, we get to ascribe those gifts, or I should say those fruits, to us. And they can be ours. And we incorporate love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The best way of building the kingdom is to live the kingdom. And the best way to spread the gospel is to live the gospel. And that's what we're called to do, to let people know that the kingdom of heaven is already here in the presence of those who know Jesus, like I was saying to the children, who have him speaking to their hearts, and then share that with others. So that kingdom of heaven has already begun. It's already in our midst. And the scripture says there will come a time when no one... No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. And you know what a blessing that would be if we could somehow get that kingdom of heaven just just working for everyone, and we could share that with everyone. Because part of the kingdom of heaven is being part of a family, the family of God. And you know, This church is supposed to be a little slice of that heaven. Your home, your family at home, is supposed to be a little slice of that kingdom of heaven. Belonging to family is really so very, very important. And sadly, the family is under attack these days in our culture. Why? I think it's simply because the enemy is working overtime because the family unit is to be one of the greatest representations of the love and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God that he has for his children. And if you can destroy the family unit, then you destroy that greatest example of presenting what that love and that support and that caring is all about and meant to be and how God responds to his people. And the family unit is under attack. And it's very sad. And, you know, there's so many people out there who just don't have a connection to family. There was a a newspaper article again uh, some years ago, and it was about a little boy. I just want to share this with you because it uh, kind of moved me. And apparently, I'm just going to read it as I I have it right here, so I'm just going to read most of it so that I don't miss anything. This little boy was riding a bus. He's only about six years old, I understand, at the time, maybe seven And on the bus, he was huddled closely to an exquisitely dressed lady who was swinging, and he was swinging his leg out into the aisle, and he accidentally rubbed his shoe against the woman who sat across from him. And very angrily, that woman protested to the woman the boy was sitting beside, and she said, pardon me, but can you make your son, your little boy, remove his dirty feet from the seat? And the well-dressed woman looked down, a hard look at the youngster, and she said, I don't even know this kid. And so this little boy apologized to this woman. And so she started talking to him. Not the one that called him down, but the one that he had gotten dirty with his foot. And she asked him, she said, are you traveling by yourself? And he said, yes, yes, I am. He, says, he said, my mom and my dad both are dead, and I live with my Aunt Maggie, but when she gets tired of me, she sends me off to Aunt Elizabeth. And I don't always know if she's home when I get there, so I just take my time on the bus. And this lady says, you you sure are young to be riding the bus alone. And he said, well, it's okay. I never get lost, but sometimes I get awfully lonesome. So when I see someone I'd like to belong to, 
I sit really close to them and I pretend that they're my family. You just wanted to belong to somebody, to be part of a family. I'm going to have Liz come up here for a minute and just tell a story that uh, happened in our family. Yeah, that's good. Um, we adopted Jason when he was three years old, and um, he had belonged, he had been in, not belonged, he, he was in a foster home for all his, his life, right from the hospital when, after he was born, he was in foster home. Only one foster home. But that's, uh, foster kids, I ex understand and experienced having adopted three kids from the foster system, that they never feel secure. And our kids were in many different foster homes. Jason had only been in one foster home. Of course, when the foster family goes on vacation, um, the foster kids go to other foster homes. When the foster family goes to visit grandmas or grandpas, the foster kids go to babysitters. They never belong to the family. And Jason, for the longest time he was with us, at least six months when he would be, every time I'd say, we're going to the store, or we're going to visit grandma, or we're going to the cottage, he would always say, and me too. It took him six months before he knew he was part of we. Mm. But then he had a better response every time after that, every time I said, I love you, he said, I love you more. Just wanted to be part of the family. We used to do um, foster care when we lived in Moosonee too. It was emergency foster care. So the children would be, have to be pulled out of a, a difficult situation and they'd be placed with us for maybe two weeks or three weeks. And we had two little girls, right Liz, remember them? And uh, well, of course you do better than I do. But these two little girls, whenever we would sit down to eat, Liz would say, come and eat. And the one little girl would say, kids too? And we realized that these children probably didn't have any sense of what it was to sit down as a family to eat together and uh, probably didn't even know that the food was available to them as it was to everybody else. We all want to be part of a family and part of the kingdom of God is being part of that family. And this family, which we call all saints, is meant to be a small slice of the kingdom of heaven. And your family at home is meant to be a small slice of the kingdom of heaven. And we need to be in relationship. And the kingdom of God has not yet come in all its fullness. Okay, it's just a precursor. We're just seeing, getting a foretaste of what the kingdom of God is meant to be. But we are called to be helped to build that kingdom of God, to be the gospel. That's the best way to spread the gospel, is to be the gospel. There's an ancient legend about a monk one time who found a precious stone and he put it in his bag and he was walking and uh, another gentleman came alongside him who obviously looked very unkempt, someone who was very needy and asked the monk if he could share some of his provisions. And the monk shared with him some of the bread that he had and so on. But then the man noticed in his bag that very precious stone and the man asked the monk if he could have that stone. And without hesitation, the monk turned it over and gave it to him. Well, the man went away, just, just elated to have this new possession. But he came back a few days later, and he gave the stone back to the monk. And he said, you know, it's not really this stone that I want, he said. But he said, I want you to give me that which enabled you to give this stone to me, a stranger. I want to have what you have. That would be wonderful if people would come up to us and say, hey, I've noticed there's something different about you. I want to know what you have, and I want to have some of that too. It's part of what the kingdom of God is supposed to be. We're supposed to be sharing it. Now, 
Keep in mind that scripture does not say that the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who found a pearl of great price. And he went and he sold all that he had. Must have taken some work to sell all that he had so that he could come back and buy that one thing. That's sacrifice. That's commitment. That's dedication. That's effort. And that too is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. Is you and I, as part of that kingdom, are to be building that kingdom in the place where we are today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for welcoming us into your kingdom. Thank you that we can celebrate that kingdom with others who also know you so well. Thank you for this slice of heaven right here at All Saints, where you are known, your name is proclaimed, and where we can gather together because we all know Jesus. Thank you for this family of faith. And Father, give us the dedication, the desire, the burden in our hearts to build that kingdom amongst those who have yet to hear the good news. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Yeah, I'm going to ask an...